Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Ben, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills, where I'm going to be talking about Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. So Fresh Red Kills is where I talk about things, books, uh, that I have recently read or that I am currently reading. Uh, now, since the last Fresh Red Kills episode, um, a couple weeks ago, I had actually finished several books. Um, however, I'm just going to talk about one of them in this episode, and I'll talk about some others in a separate episode. Uh, so this is going to be a fairly short video, fairly short discussion, uh, but I'm also going to include some footage from a recent trip that I took with my son to a local Native American museum. Um, so you can see a little bit what that's like. It was just kind of a, a late fall outing uh, with my son and um, also a friend of mine and his son. Uh, but um, we had some very interesting conversations about Native American history and heritage uh, recently. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, so first, um, in uh, the early part of November, uh, November being nonfiction November, where people are encouraged to read more nonfiction, and I already read tons of nonfiction, so I don't need any encouragement in that respect. Uh, but November is also Native American Heritage Month. Um, and I realized, you know, I've had this on my shelf for a long time. I've been wanting to read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee uh, by D. Brown for a very long time. And I thought I'd just this is the time to do it. Uh, November of 2021 would, will be the month. Um, you can see the subtitle is an American uh, history, sorry, an Indian history of the American West. And this deals with the time period uh, basically from the Civil War up to the Wounded Knee Massacre. And hearing, seeing that, um, that time period uh, from the perspective of Native Americans. Uh, so this it's undoubtedly a powerful uh, and important book. Um, D. Brown was in many ways writing some serious wrongs, you know, uh, always seeing history from one side when he wrote this in 1970. Uh, and we should also, though, uh, bear in mind as we read it um, that this is the Indian history. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it is in many ways still a one-sided affair. Uh, so, you know, as you're reading, you do get the impression sometimes that there maybe is more to the story, just like if you were reading the, the white version of history, uh, you know, the more traditional American history, especially as it was told up until around 1970. Uh, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, although D. Brown does not indulge in basically glorifying and sanctifying all Native Americans, uh, we certainly see Native Americans sometimes commit acts of cruelty, um, you know, make mistakes. Uh, sometimes they are the perpetrators of violence, uh, certainly, but most often, of course, uh, this is a depressing story of tribes uh, and nations, you know, uh, losing their territory, losing their lives, uh, losing their heritage. Um, sometimes the book can actually feel a little bit, you know, repetitive, uh, and that's not Brown's fault. It's because you see the same thing <laughs> occurring over and over and over again, uh, you know, to different tribes. Um, this is in many ways, something of a military history. Uh, it does focus mostly on the um, physical engagements. We don't get a lot of cultural history in here, social history, certainly. Uh, a lot of it does have to do with the physical conflicts that occurred uh, between Native Americans and the American government. Uh, but throughout this, there were some uh, terrific kind of profiles of people. Now, of course, I had known the names of a lot of these people, but I didn't know a lot of the details. This is not a part of history that I am intimately familiar with. Um, I'm an American who lives on the East Coast. I'm in Connecticut, New England. Uh, the West is a good distance from me. <laughs> it, it takes It's a long drive uh, to get there. Um, so this is not at all local history for me, even though it is my, my nation's history. Uh, so there were names that I was familiar with. Um, you know, of course, I knew, you know, Sitting Bull and things like that. But uh, there are other ones like Cochise or Chief Joseph, uh, Red Cloud, who I kind of knew their names. I vaguely knew a little bit about them, but um, there was certainly a lot that I, I just did not know. And I found out a tremendous amount. Uh, and there were some people I didn't know anything about, uh, but that I am now incredibly curious uh, to find out more. So like one of them is this figure here that just seems absolutely fascinating. Uh, Eli Parker, or his Native American name, uh, Donna Hogawa. Seneca chief, um, but also under 
President Grant, he became Commissioner of Indian Affairs, uh, which is amazing that you had basically a Native American actually heading up the Commission of Indian Affairs. He was all, he was an engineer. Um, during the Civil War, he wanted to join as an engineer uh, to help the Union cause, and they told him, we don't have room for, for Natives. Uh, this is a white man's war. Uh, finally, he was actually friends with Ulysses S. Grant, uh, and Grant got him in, and as an engineer, he helped uh, uh, Grant lay siege to Vicksburg. Um, and afterwards, uh, Grant, you know, appoints him, uh, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and, uh, Grant actually comes out as a very interesting person. I definitely want to read more about him. I have the, the big biography, um, that came out a few years ago of Grant in here. I have his memoirs. Uh, he comes off, um, as in many ways, very sympathetic to the Native American plight. Um, it does seem like as his, uh, years in office go on, maybe he gets a little bit less sympathetic, or maybe the corruption uh, is, you know, just not handled well, uh, that is that is occurring. Um, I'm, you know, I, I only have a very cursory knowledge of that whole era. Uh, I definitely have to look more into it. Um, but he does seem like somebody who did have some sympathies, uh, at least. And this person in particular, his story in this was absolutely fascinating. And especially uh, the prejudice that he received, um, you know, from whites in government and how they basically tried to push him out. Uh, and he had to, you know, make some tough decisions, especially because he had such great respect for Grant. Uh, he didn't want Grant's reputation sullied in this whole thing. Um, so I thought his whole story was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and you have all kinds of other, you know, very towering figures in here. Um, and you do have images. Every single image in here, though, is, it is a portrait. Well, here we have at least a, a couple of portraits here. Um, it's basically Chief's posing. Uh, those are really the only images that we have in here. I kind of wish that there were maps. Uh, it would help me at least a little bit geographically to orientate myself when we're talking about the different tribes and where they're fighting, etc. Uh, you know, uh, it's it definitely does... Um, uh, assume that you have a pretty good geography of the American West. Um, so I definitely had to look a few things up sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I, I really did enjoy this read. Um, I thought that it was quite good and deserving of its reputation and certainly whet my appetite to, uh, find out more about Native American history and, and certain figures like, like that gentleman, not that one that I'm pointing to, but the one I was just talking about, um, Eli Parker or, um, and even people like President Grant. Um, so as I was finishing this, uh, actually a little bit after I finished it, um, it was actually the, this past week, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, my son came home and he was telling me, oh yeah, we learned about the uh, Thanksgiving dinner, uh, in school today. And he's nine years old. He's in fourth grade. I said, oh yeah, wh what'd you learn about it? You know? So he's talking about how, you know, the Indians brought deer and food and all this stuff. So. We were talking about pilgrims, and he was expressing an interest in uh, Native American, you know, uh, life and uh, what was going on during that time. So I had seen on Disney Plus that there was a movie called Squanto, A Warrior's Journey or Tale, or I don't remember exactly how it's, what the subtitle is. Um, came out in the, like, around 1994, um, a live-action story of Squanto. Uh, which I don't even remember this thing coming out. Um, but I saw it was like, it was like PG and I thought, okay, uh, my wife was gone for the night and I figured I'll watch that with my son and my daughter. She's five. And, uh, it's a very Disney-fied, um, you know, not terribly well-written, uh, version of Squanto's life. Uh, Squanto who, you know, in kids learn about, uh, him helping the pilgrims when they arrive and teaching him how to like plant corn and, make peace with other tribes and uh you know much of his story is always generally left out the fact that he was taken as a slave and uh, that's how he learned English and when he returned to his village he found out they had all died of smallpox while he was gone so he actually has a very tragic story and we watched this Disney film and it truncates and simplifies and Disney fies everything but my kids were engaged and it was introducing them to some pretty valuable concepts uh like prejudice like mistreatment uh, mistrust between the English and Native Americans. Uh, they did see, you know, Squanto return to his village and find it empty. Uh, they saw that, you know, the movie does show that sometimes 
both sides were perpetrators of violence and uh you know uh at the end um you know i don't know how much of a spoiler this is i'm not really worried about spoilers with this movie uh but squanto kind of gives this big speech um at the thanksgiving dinner which is a culmination in this movie and uh now there's there's like one sun, one moon, one mother earth, and we can all live in peace. And then this text comes up and it talks about how after about two generations, people forgot Squanto's wise words. And the English were pushing the Native Americans off their land. So my son was asking about that. He read that and he kept wanting to know more. Uh, so we it prompted some good conversations about um yeah, you know, about colonialism and what happened to Native Americans and infectious disease and smallpox. Uh so we decided that we would go and check out the local Native American Museum. It's the Institute for American Indian Studies, uh, which is in Washington, Connecticut. Um, actually, a fairly short drive uh, from where I live. Um, I've been there years ago, but he hadn't been there yet. And I thought this is a perfect time. Uh, the weather wasn't too cold yet. Uh, it, it actually dropped over this past weekend. Um, so I figured one last decent fall day, uh, let's get out and let's go explore this museum. And he had a good time. Uh, I, he bought some stuff in the gift shop. I ended up getting, um, uh, The Only Good Indians by, uh, Seth Graham Jones, kind of a horror novel dealing with indigenous people. Uh, so I picked up that in the gift shop. Um, but, uh, he, he really enjoyed himself and he liked it and I think he learned quite a bit. So, uh, I'm going to finish up this video, uh, by sharing just some very quick footage of that place and, and our visit. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it ended up being a, a very valuable experience for us and prompted some good conversations with my son. So anyway, uh, please enjoy the video and uh, thank you, Bluetooth.